We are glad to have you with us today. And if you uh, are new with us, you haven't been with us in a while, we have been working through the Gospel of John. If you remember, we've been doing this for about five weeks now. And as we've been working through the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus has been doing some pretty crazy stuff. I mean, if you remember, some of these miracles are pretty impressive. Like when Jesus just instantaneously turns water into wine. Or well, as we saw a couple weeks ago, Jesus has this ability to break down racial, cultural, gender barriers through one conversation. I mean, that's, that's impressive. And then, as we saw last week, Jesus has the ability with nothing more than his word, nothing more than a promise, from 20 miles away, the ability to bring a boy back from the brink of death. I mean, this guy has done some pretty crazy stuff. And as we're going to see, at this point in John's gospel, word of Jesus has spread. In fact, we are about the halfway point of Jesus' ministry. And as you know, if you've read the other gospels, John doesn't tell us everything Jesus did. We know there are dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of other teaching moments and miracles that are recorded in the other gospels that John just totally ignores. And what's happened is this idea of who Jesus is is spreading like wildfire. In fact, as we're going to see in this one story, Jesus is pulling some massive crowds. Some scholars say that the crowd that we're going to talk about today was upwards of 20,000 people strong. This is not just some one-off event. This guy is getting some momentum. And in fact, as we're going to read, the crowds are beginning to pick up on the momentum of Jesus. The crowds are beginning to realize there is something about this guy. And in fact, there's rumblings of saying, we need to make this guy our king. But what happens is, is quite stark. Because within a 24-hour period, because of one conversation, Jesus goes from being the man they want to make king to being the man they can't get away from fast enough. It's quite remarkable. And it's all because, I said, one conversation. One conversation about religion, of all things. The nature of religion. What is religion all about? And through this one conversation, Jesus has the audacity. The audacity to claim something that no other religion, no other religious teacher was ever bold enough to claim. And in fact, what he says is so offensive, so shocking, that even his own disciples run away from him. And I'm going to argue, as you see, as we, we look at this claim today, this claim still packs quite the punch. In fact, this claim of Jesus, this audacious statement by him, is still what many find to be the reason they don't want anything to do with Christianity. Or anything to do with Jesus. This is a big statement. But that's incredibly unfortunate. Because here's the thing. If what Jesus says is true. If what Jesus says is right on the money. Then those who run away from him. Those who are simply offended by what he has to say. Those who don't want to hear anything more. Than what they're, they're bothered by. Then they miss out on what he offers. But if we're willing to sit through the offensive nature of what he has to say, if we're willing to take it and not run, if we're willing to simply submit and say, okay, what else do you got? What he offers truly has the potential to revolutionize your life. And that's not an understatement. What Jesus offers has the potential to change the way you think, the way you speak, the way you act, the way you engage other people, the way you define morality, the way you, you know, every, every decision and interaction you make. It's truly revolutionary. And it all comes to this one conversation. And so today we're going to look at that conversation. And so I invite you to open up with me to John chapter 6. We're going to see it. We're going to look through it. We're going to work through it. Um, but it's all in John chapter 6. Now, as you open to John 6, you're going to notice this is a long chapter. 70 verses. This is a huge section of scripture. Now, I'm not going to read all 70 verses today, um, but instead, what I am going to encourage you to do is go home today and reread this passage. Of all the passages of John, this is one of the most dense ones we've come across so far. You're going to need to go back and reread it. But my hope is, my aim is, by the end of today, you can look at John 6 and be like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. I totally see it. I can engage it. Because I imagine there are some of you who read John 6 before coming into this, and you're like, what is this about? 
this is weird stuff. Well, I'm going to make sense of it, okay? Now, as I said, because it's so long, we're not going to read everything, so we will be throwing some verses up on the screen, but I want you to have it open because as you look at John chapter 6, you're going to notice a couple things. There's a number of subtitles in John chapter 6, and the first two deal with two miracles, right? What is the first miracle? Feeding of the 5,000, and then the second miracle is he walks on water. Right? These are two pretty crazy miracles. I'm not going to go in and explain everything about these miracles, but what I do want to call your attention to is this. In these miracles, and really this entire chapter, John is trying to make it clear that Jesus is greater than Moses. What these two miracles, and really what this whole conversation is about, is that Jesus is far superior to Moses, and therefore what Jesus offers is of higher quality, is of greater value than anything Moses has ever offered. And if you remember, Moses is the great hero of the Old Testament, right? I mean, Moses is the superhero. He is the Avengers of the entire Old Testament. That was for the high school kids in the room. I see you've cluttered that entire row. You guys know you can spread out. Diego, you don't have to fall off the bench. (laughs) But it's all right. I get it. Tyler's a nice boy to sit next to. Okay, you could even go right in front. There's literally no one in front of you. Okay, whatever. (laughs) But Moses is the great hero of the Old Testament. And the reason Moses is the hero of the Old Testament is really two things. One, Moses is the guy that took them out of Egypt, right? They were in slavery and brokenness in Egypt, and Moses led them to freedom. But the other thing Moses did was Moses gave them the law. And this is probably what makes Moses the most important figure of the Old Testament because Moses told them what they needed to do. Moses told them how they were to live. Moses made it clear this is what God requires of you. Okay? And as you're going to see in this passage, Moses is all over the place. And in fact, we see that even before we read chapter 6. If you look at the the two or three verses right at the end of chapter 5, You're going to notice notice Moses is actually explicitly mentioned in reference to the law. And then as we start reading chapter 6, you're going to realize that the story takes place at the time of Passover, another big Moses thing. And then as the story continues to unfold, we find out in this first miracle, Jesus feeds a massive crowd in the middle of nowhere, in the wilderness. Again, much like Moses did. Now, when I say massive crowd, you're going to see it it says 5,000. And that's a bit of a misnomer because that word 5,000 really only refers to the amount of men present. It doesn't say anything about the women and it doesn't say anything about the amount of children present. And so what most scholars argue is that while there were 5,000 men present, there were upwards of 20,000 people total there. 20,000 people flocked to Jesus in the middle of nowhere to hear what he had to say. And eventually the conversation turned to, hey, where are we going to get some food? There's no Walmart around the corner. What are we going to do? Well, a little boy comes up with a couple fish sandwiches and says, well, what do you want to do with this? And Jesus goes, I can work with that. And so Jesus begins to take these fish sandwiches and he just starts splitting them, tearing them apart, tearing them apart. And the disciples pass out the food. But you can kind of get the image, and and normally when we read this story, we just move right through. But you got to think about, this would have taken forever. I mean, how long does it take when you go to a wedding with 200 people and you have to go through the banquet line? You know what I'm talking about? And sometimes you're like, come on, hurry it up. I should have ate before we came. 20,000 people now need to be fed. So as the tearing is taking place, the people begin to talk, much like you do at a wedding when you're waiting for the banquet. And as they begin to talk, somebody's starting to wonder, hey, where is he getting all these fish sandwiches from? Is there like a, like a mini fridge under this rock that he keeps pulling them out from? Is there just a Walmart on the other side of the hill? What is going on? And soon people begin to realize, okay, he's just producing this food himself. It's coming. It's originating from him. And then somebody gets the idea and they go, this is so much like what Moses did. When the people were wandering in the wilderness, Moses provided food to the people in the wilderness. And then somebody chimes in and they're like, yeah, this is like what Moses said in Deuteronomy 18, where he talked about one day there would be this future prophet figure to come who would do the things that Moses did. And some other guy was like, yeah, if, 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 if somebody, I mean, we haven't seen anybody else do anything like this in the past. This is remarkable. This is incredible. He's got to be the prophet. He's got to be the one Moses talked about. And so they then get the idea. 
If this is the guy Moses talked about, what are we waiting for, boys? Let's saddle up. We got an army here. We got 5,000 men. Let's force this guy to be our king and let's go take on the Romans. He can do some pretty crazy stuff. Let's see what we got. We got an army. Well, Jesus gets wind of this and he says to his disciples, all right, boys, you got to get out of here. I don't want you to get caught up in this. So boys, you just get up on the lake. I'll meet you on the other side. We'll, we'll chat soon, but I got to go get some space alone to pray. So Jesus goes off to pray on his own. And what his disciples didn't know is when he said he was going to meet up with them later, he meant in the middle of the lake, in the middle of a storm. And so what happens is, as you read this story, is there's, the disciples are freaking out because there's these massive waves breaking over the bow, and they're like struggling, and then all of a sudden, up comes Jesus just cruising by. Hey! How you doing? It's, it's nuts. And then we're told Jesus gets in the boat, and again, like Moses, he takes his people across the sea to safety. He gets them across. You see, Moses is all over this place, and John wants us to see it. And more importantly, as we read in this next conversation, Moses is going to come up repeatedly. Repeatedly, he's going to come up. John's whole point, the big key to this passage is you have to understand Jesus is greater than Moses, and therefore what Jesus has to offer is far superior to anything Moses could ever offer. Okay? But what I want to do is I want to look at the conversation together. So we're going to actually start in chapter 6, verse 25. And so I invite you to open up with me to John chapter 6, verse 25. As I said, we will throw it on the screen. So after, I should set this scene, after Jesus and the disciples leave, those, that crowd wasn't done with Jesus. So they start scrambling around the lake to try and find him. Hey, where'd he go? And eventually they find him. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi! When did you get here? See, the image I get is, and we're told all of this takes place in a synagogue, and so it's on a church, if you will, and so they just burst through the doors, and somebody's like, ah, ah, Jesus! Hey! What a coincidence! You worship here too? I do too! It's so good to see. When did you get here? And then they just, you know, this is how, again, I read it. They just nudged him. Hey, you want to go hang out and have some hamburgers or fish sandwiches again? Ah. And Jesus, at this point, just looks at him. And he tells him, verse 26, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. You guys have no idea what happened yesterday, do you? You totally missed it. You just liked my parlor trick. But I tell you, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. That is what the Son of Man will give you. See, you're just looking for a short-term fix. You're looking for your quick high. But I'm offering you something that has the potential to revolutionize your life. So they say, okay, verse 28. They asked him, we're in. What do we got to do to do the doing that God requires to be done. What do we got to do to do the doing, to do, 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 do? Do you understand the, the emphasis of this sentence here? What are the works that we have to do? What do we have to bring to the table? What do we have to contribute? What does God require of us to do? Jesus, we get it. You are like Moses. You are a great teacher. You're at least like the prophets. And when Moses and the prophets came on board, they were explicit. They gave us rules. We love rules. What do we need to do to do the doing that God requires us to do to experience the life that God requires us to do? What do we got to do? Give us a rule. Jesus, do we got to go to church more? Jesus, do I need to pray more? Is it, maybe it's not a 10% tithe, maybe it's 15%. Is that where you're at? Is there a certain amount of pilgrimages I am supposed to attend to achieve, you know, righteousness? Jesus goes, you're missing the point. And it's with this next statement, Jesus literally turns religion on its head. He says something nobody else was ever bold enough to say. Jesus answered, the work of God is this. The only thing you have to do is believe in the one he has sent. The only thing you contribute, the only thing you bring to the table 
is your faith. You don't bring anything else. You can't possibly bring anything else. If you want to experience this life that God offers you, this life that Jesus is saying is available to you today, you got to give up on the idea that you somehow can do something and you need to just stop and trust me. You need to stop thinking you can contribute and you need to trust in the efforts of somebody else. You don't bring anything to the table. It's about what the one God has sent brings to the table. Well, this is so revolutionary. The people are so surprised by this statement. They recognize this is a bold statement. And so they recognize, okay, we, I, I can't take this at face value. And so they ask him, Jesus, can you give me a sign? Can you prove that what you're saying is true? So they asked him, what sign will you give us that we may see and believe you? What will you do? Jesus, our ancestors, they ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, church, it is a good thing that I am not Jesus. Because if somebody had walked into church and asked Jesus this question, I would have just walked up to him, like really on behalf of Jesus, and smacked him in the head and went, what is wrong with you, stupid? You mean like what happened yesterday? The whole fish sandwich in the wilderness? You want another fish sandwich in the wilderness? Like, come on. But Jesus doesn't do that because he's smarter than that. Instead, Jesus corrects their theology. Verse 32, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you true bread from heaven. You need to remember, Moses didn't actually give you the bread. Moses just woke up one morning and there was manna laying on the ground. God is the one who gives the bread. And it's God who is giving something now. God, for the bread of God, is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. God continues to offer you this bread. So they say, verse 34, Sir, that sounds good. Always give us this bread. And at this, you just, I just see it. Jesus is like taking the thermostat and he goes, Let's turn up the heat a little. I am the bread. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Okay, see what Jesus is doing here is he's not only saying you can't contribute to your salvation and you have to, you have to trust in the efforts of another person. With this statement, he's saying, I'm the one you have to trust. Me, not you, me. And at this, they just lose it. The crowd just goes, What? Look at verse 41. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because they said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, who are you? Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his mom. We know his dad. How can he say, I came down from heaven? You're not that special. We know you, and you're telling me you're better than me? We grew up with you, dude. I know your mom. I know your dad. You didn't come down from heaven. Who are you to make such an audacious claim? Well, at this point, Jesus just goes, I I don't know how to make things more clear, so I'm going to reiterate myself. Verse 47, very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me has eternal life, for I am the bread of life. Your ancestors, they had something of lesser value. They ate manna in the wilderness, and they still died. But here is something of far greater value. Here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not ever die. I am that bread. The bread that came down from heaven. And whoever eats this bread, whoever eats what I offer, will live forever. The bread is my flesh which I give for the life of the world. It's that last line that they just go ballistic on. Look at verse 52. Then the Jews began to argue, What? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? What just happened? At this point, Jesus just doubles down on the metaphor, and he says, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and you drink his blood, you have no life. 
Whoever eats my flesh, though, and whoever drinks my blood, they have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. What just happened? Did you catch this? We started out this morning talking about real, literal bread. You know, like little, little water, a little flour, a little yeast in the mix. I'm not a baker. I assume there's more involved. And then all of a sudden, we start talking about religion. Okay, that makes sense. Jesus is a religious teacher. He can connect things to religion. And then he seems to be advocating cannibalism. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. What? Look, at this point, it's totally understandable if you're thinking, well, how do I get out that door, that door without being noticed? Because this Christian thing is creepy. Okay, well, number one, you're normal if you're thinking that. I thought the first time I read this too, I was like, what is he getting at? This is a weird statement, but here's the thing. It's a metaphor, okay? And I say it's a metaphor not because I'm trying to simply dismiss it, but it really is the only thing that possibly makes sense of this passage, Nowhere in the rest of Scripture is God advocating for cannibalism. In fact, in the law, cannibalism is explicitly prohibited. You just can't do it. That's not a thing. So there's no way Jesus is going against all of Scripture with this one thing and now advocating cannibalism. So what is he doing? He's got to be using it as a metaphor. And what I'm going to argue is this isn't a metaphor that we're actually that unfamiliar with. It's one we use regularly. For instance, when was the last time you devoured a good book? Or when was the last time you sat through a lecture or you went to a conference and you described it as drinking from a fire hose? Have any of you ever looked at your children or your grandchildren and just said, oh, I could just eat you all up? Maybe at this moment, some of you are beginning to chew on what I'm saying. You see... We use the metaphor regularly. It's, it's common for us. And it's absolutely in the same vein as Jesus is using it. When Jesus is talking about eating his flesh and blood, what he's getting at is you need to chew on me. In much the same way we devour a good book. Right? When you devour a good book, you don't just read it, shut it, set it down, walk away, and forget about it. When you come across a good book, I mean a really good book, or you've listened to a great lecture you continue to go back and re-listen to it or reread it. And then more importantly, you take what it is that you have learned and you try and take it with you. You bring that content with you and you begin to filter everyday decisions through the lens of what you have learned, right? So if you're reading a good book on management, right, and on how to treat other people, and you're like, this is so good. When you set that on the shelf, you go into your office, and you naturally begin to start thinking through the principles of how does this affect the way I treat other people? How is this going to change the way I make decisions? Jesus is getting at the exact same thing. He's saying, I don't want you to have a casual relationship with me. I want you to take me with you. I want you to take what I have to say, what I have to offer, what I am teaching you. I want you to bring that with you so that it begins to inform the way you think and act and speak and engage other people, interact with other people, make your decisions. I want you to bring that with you. If you are ever going to experience eternal life, Jesus says, if you are ever going to experience the life that Jesus has to offer you, you have to trust in him and allow him to shape it. Well, this statement is just so offensive. This reality, this understanding, that even his own disciples begin to grumble. Look at verse 60. On hearing this, many of his own disciples said, this is hard teaching. This is not like anything anybody else has ever taught. This is totally counter to what we've ever been told. Who can accept it? So aware of that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said, I'm sorry. Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Will that be enough of a miracle for you to believe what it is that I'm saying? Will you finally then realize that what I have to offer you is better than anything you can offer yourself? See, the Spirit gives life. It's the only thing that gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. You can't earn this life. You can't work towards it. You can't contribute to it. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of Spirit and life. 
Yet there are still some of you who do not believe. And from this time, many of his own disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Okay, but why? What is so offensive about what Jesus has said? I mean, truth be told, for the last 2,000 years, this idea that Jesus is espousing has actually remained the, the cornerstone of the Christian faith, right? And so I assume many of us in this room are able to get over that natural offense. But many of us can't. And many of us who are not in this room really struggle with this claim. Why? What is so offensive about this belief that you can't earn your salvation, but you have to trust in someone else for it. And then let's just assume we can get over this offense. What does it practically look like to trust him? What does it practically look like to consume Jesus, to get him inside of us? I want to spend the rest of our time talking about those two things, okay? But first, let's talk about the, the what is so offensive about this. Well, you could naturally, you could naturally write this off and say what's so offensive about this is simply the idea that the people didn't understand the metaphor, right? You could assume that these disciples, the reason they're leaving is because they just didn't get that the flesh and blood thing was a metaphor, and they're just caught up on this cannibalism charge. But that really doesn't work when you read verse 41. Remember, in verse 41, they're already blowing off Jesus. Who do you think you are? Aren't you Joseph's kid? We know who you are. You're not special. And in fact, if you go back even further to verse 30, before he even points to himself as the one who has the ability to save us, the people realize his claim that you can't save yourself is so offensive, so radical, so different than anything else. They demand a sign as further evidence of what it is that Jesus has to claim. So even the people understand that this isn't isn't just about a misinterpretation of a metaphor. There is something incredibly offensive, but what is it? Why is it so offensive for me to claim that the only way to experience eternal life, the only way to experience the life that you and I long for, salvation or the life God intended you to live, however you want to define that term, What is so offensive about me saying the only way to experience that life is for you to recognize you can't do anything to save you, but you have to trust in someone else? Well, the the simple answer is this. We don't like to surrender. We don't like to admit we need help. But the very basic understanding of this is this. If we are ever going to get to a place where we fully begin to trust someone else, where we begin to rely on somebody else, we must get to a place where we are willing and able to surrender our wills to the will of another person. Surrender our ideas of what is right and wrong, our ideas of how to love other people, our ideas of how to live our lives to the discretion of another person. We have to admit we can't contribute. We have to admit we don't have the ability to fix ourselves. And therefore, we have to stop trying to dig ourselves out of the holes, out of the messes we find ourselves in, and we need to simply stop. And we need to fall on the mercy of another person. Guys, if we struggle to give our car keys to somebody else because we're afraid of what they're going to do to our car, Imagine how much harder it would be to hand somebody the keys of your life to somebody else and say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. You make my decisions for me. That's so uncomfortable. I mean, that just goes against our basic human nature. This is not something any of us are comfortable with. And most interestingly, I don't know if you've ever stopped and thought about this, It is literally something no other religion or religious teacher was ever bold enough to say. Literally every other religion out there is about what you bring to the table. It's about what you do, how you contribute, your efforts. Think about it. Whether it's Islam, whether it's Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, Taoism, New Age theology, atheism... Freshmen, what did you have in your projects last year? Some of you were... I think I covered most of them. It doesn't matter. You name the religion. 
You name the religion, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's all about what you have to do. What you do to improve your standing with God, or what you do to achieve the type of life that you want. I mean, even atheism, think about this. Atheism, at the end of the day, comes down to this reality, okay, there's nothing after life, and there's no God to please, but in order for you to experience the full life, you have to do something. You have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You have to influence the world around you. Hinduism, how do they do it? They work on this karma system, right? Good begets good, bad begets bad. Uh, Buddhism, they have the eightfold path. If you want to experience enlightenment, you have to do these eight things. Islam, you have the five pillars of Islam you have to do. At the end of the day, every other religion, while they have nuanced differences between, you know, how many gods they have and what happens to you when you die, literally every other religion at the end of the day is about what you do. It's about what you bring to the table. It's about what you contribute. But Jesus is throwing all of that out. And in this passage, Jesus is turning the whole idea of religion on its head, and he's making the claim that you can't do anything. You can't save yourself. Instead of trusting in yourself, you have to trust in another. You have to trust in him and what he offers you. If you ever want to experience eternal life, you have to allow him to begin to shape your life. And guys, this is what is so offensive. No one in this room ever wants to get to a place where they admit they're a total train wreck in life and they have no idea what they're doing. I mean, do you know how hard it is for many alcoholics to get to a breaking point where they're willing to go to a meeting and simply go, yeah, I have a problem? It's the first step, right? And in our culture, we have made alcoholism, it's all over the place, as this is something we are not all for, you know, alcoholism is a bad thing, and yet there are still so many alcoholics that live in denial that they have a problem in the first place. And it's everywhere. Society is constantly telling them, this is wrong, this is bad, this is not good, you need help. And they still struggle. Well, if that's just on one issue, think about this on any other issues. Maybe you don't have a vice that's popular right now, but we all have to recognize what Jesus is getting at is that in deep down, we are all broken. We all need help. We are all train wrecks. And that's not something anybody's comfortable with. It is not comfortable when we have to admit at the end of the day, I don't know what I'm doing. I need help. And so for this reason, many people have been turned off to the idea of Christianity of, no, no, I'm fine. I don't need Jesus. Okay, maybe I'll let him speak into some areas of my life, right? We all are comfortable with admitting there's not, we're not perfect in everything. And so we allow Jesus to speak into maybe some areas, or we look to new age theology or any other religion to kind of fix those areas we're comfortable fixing. And Jesus is saying, no, all of you. You have to surrender completely your will to my will. Your ways of thinking to my ways of thinking. Every decision, every interaction, it's not about how you would handle it, it's about how I would handle it. If you ever want to experience that life, well, that is so hard. And that's offensive to people. Okay, but let's say we get over the offense. Let's say we're willing to look past that. Let's say we're willing to say, okay, yeah, I'm a train wreck. What does it practically look like to trust the man? Naturally, you want to go to, well, you read your Bible more and you do what it says. Yeah, it's totally true. But I think what he's getting at, and this is where the the metaphor of, of the flesh and blood thing is so helpful. See, what he's getting at is the same thing. Just as you devour a book, just as you continue to chew on a good lecture, Jesus is arguing, you need to do the same for me. You can't have a casual relationship with Jesus where you simply show up to church every now and then, maybe you read your devotional in the morning, maybe you pray here and there, and then you set it aside, you walk away, and you live however you want to live, and then you wonder, why is my life not as God continues to promise in his word that it will be? What is going on? Jesus' answer to that is this, you can't just have a casual relationship with him. If you are going to experience the full life, you need to consume him. You need to devour him. You need to be constantly chewing on what it is that he has revealed of himself to be true. 
Who does he say he is? What does he say he has done for you? Who does he say you are? How does he say you are to live? And you need to take all of those things that you've ever learned, the understandings of the gospel. And if your understanding of the gospel is nothing but guilt and shame, you're not reading the gospel. I don't know who told you that, but you're wrong. What Jesus continues to speak into you is edifying, is building up, is reminding you that you were innately good from the beginning. And while you make some dumb decisions, God can fix anything. And so you don't have to try and cover it up with more brokenness or more sin or more evil. He goes, no, no, I can fix anything. Bring it to me. And so what you do is you continue to chew on who Jesus is and who he has revealed himself to be as you go about your day. As you come across your mundane, everyday activities, you simply go, okay, how would Jesus handle this? How would Jesus treat this person? How would Jesus engage this decision? What should we do? And it's simply asking those basic questions. Melissa this week started a podcast that did just this. And I'll tell you, at first I was like, man, these people are nuts, the amount of effort they put into this. But in this podcast, it's just a couple moms that are beginning to think think through and say, okay, what if I took the gospel and I allowed it to inform my everyday mundane decisions? And they began to think through everything from social media posts to the wardrobe they had to the time they spent in the morning. I mean, it was crazy, the stuff they went through. And I'm not talking about the basic stuff, like morality or how you post things in a way to improve you know other people this stuff was like out of the ordinary it was basically thinking about okay if jesus was going to do my morning routine how long would it take him so that i can get time to my family while at the same time still feeling good about myself and i was like i never thought about that if jesus was engaging with a post on social media how would this make jesus respond is this true of how jesus responds to things and if people are constantly nag- nagging and tearing you down in the midst of this how do you respond to that person or do you just unfollow them so that you're no longer burdened by them i'm telling you i was like i would have never thought about this but what they're getting at and i'm not telling you to advocate i'm not advocating for you to look at every area of your life right now and think of how jesus would handle that but what i am saying is If you take regular time to be refocused, to be mindful of what Jesus has revealed, and you continue to take those ideas with you, and as you begin to engage even the seemingly mundane, ordinary activities, just through the lens of how would Jesus handle this, what he says, this is the boldness of his claim, is that you will begin to experience eternal life. You will begin to experience the life that God has offered you. I will stand here and testify to you, I am not good at doing this in every area of my life. I'm just not. I'm not comfortable handing over the keys of all areas of my life. But in the areas where I have surrendered, in the areas where I have, Jesus has repeatedly proven himself to me. And many of you in this room can testify to this in your own ways. When you get to a breaking point and you finally say, all right, Jesus, what would you do here? It's revolutionary totally changes the way you think, act, speak. Okay, so the last thing, you got to find spaces, though, to be reoriented, right? I mean, I don't know if you realize that's why we come to church. We don't come to church. We don't read our Bibles. We don't pray because we think it's going to save us. He's already been explicit in this passage. It has nothing to do with that. So why do we do this? Because every single one of us in our innate nature is prone to wander from God, Prone to wander, Lord, I fear it. Right? We constantly pull away, and we need to be reminded. We need checkpoints, moments in the service, moments in our day to bring us back and go, no, 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 what is Jesus saying? What is Jesus doing? How do I respond to this through his lens? This is why we have church. It's why it's important to make it a regular habit in your life, because this is what we do. We simply come and remind each other. But also, it's why it's important for you to find regular rhythms in your day, whether it's in your morning space, in your afternoon, at the bathroom time, in your car commute, you know, wherever it is. Before you walk home, before you you walk into the door at the end of your day, into the chaos, and you just go, you know, I'm going to sit in my car for five minutes and just reorient myself. Those types of spaces are incredibly invaluable so that as you enter into those other spaces, you don't go in as how John would do it or how you would do it, You go in with the mindset of, how would Jesus handle this? It's an audacious claim. It's a bold statement to say you can't contribute in any way to your salvation. But honestly, at the end of the day, is anybody else tired of trying? 
I mean, you've all, you can keep trying all you want. And if you want, you can check out these other religions. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter which one you pick because it's all about what you do. And there's nothing wrong with doing good things. There's a lot of benefits we can learn. But at the end of the day, it doesn't change anything. The life that Jesus offers you, salvation, eternal life, this flourishing life as we refer to it here, it only comes by surrendering to him. And so my deep encouragement to you today is give up. (laughs) Chew on what it is that he has to say and allow him to radically transform your life. Let's pray. Father, we give you honor, glory, and praise for who you are. You are a good God, a God who is constantly in relentless pursuit of us, even though we are constantly in relentless running away from you. Fortunately, you are so much greater than we are. Lord, we long deep down. I, I don't, there is this weird tension inside of us that recognizes this urge, this longing to just stop, but at the same time, we don't know how. Spirit, I pray that you would have your way with us, that we would learn to trust you, that we would learn to surrender to you in every day, meaningless to to mundane, to big decisions, interactions, all of those decisions, we want to surrender them to you. And more importantly, Lord, as we do this, may the lives we lead not just lead to our benefit, but may it truly lead to your glory. May people, our brothers, sisters, our friends, our relatives, our neighbors, may they see the life that we're beginning to partake in and may it create a hunger deep down for, in their own hearts that only you can satisfy and that you would give us the boldness to be able to point people back to your son. Lord, have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen.